campaign in 2016, I voted to leave the European Union and I campaigned to leave the European Union. And despite uh, our campaign having to battle the beast of the Scottish political establishment, we still managed to achieve over a million leave votes. And it's far too often, and to my frustration, that these leave voters are somehow airbrushed out of the picture altogether in Scotland, um, projecting Scotland as somehow Europhile, um, Euro-centric, um, and uh, keen on further integration with Europe, because that's just not the case. Um, and it's to my disappointment that the Minister for Leaving the European Union and the Scottish Parliament went to Brussels to tell an event that five million Scots voted to remain. That's just not the case. The picture is different to how it's often portrayed. And you know, I'd like to make some progress, please, first. Um, actually, Scottish attitudes are very similar to the rest of the United Kingdom. And you just had to see the social attitude survey nearly a couple of weeks ago to see that when it comes to leaving the single market, Scots are in line with the rest of the UK yeah. and they want to leave the single market. No, I'd like to make some more progress, thank you, but I will take interventions. And also in relation to immigration, we love to see that remain at a UK level and don't want to see divergence from the UK. Um, now, I know I may take our intervention now because the, the member for Edinburgh West said that actually good decisions are made by discussion and debate. Well, we had months of discussion and debate yeah. as part of that referendum campaign. Yeah. And the member said that good decisions are made out of discussion and debate. Well, I believe a good decision was made out yeah. of the lengthy discussion and debate that we had in Scotland over those months. I'll take the intervention. <laughs> Thank you very much. Would the Honourable Member then accept that what we should be doing is discussing, uh, discussing and debating and that the job of the opposition is to ensure that that debate scrutinises what the government is doing rather than simply accept and get behind them and allow them to make what might be a bad decision because there hasn't been that discussion and debate. Ross Thompson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Absolutely right. Every opposition should hold the government to account and hold their feet to the fire when it comes to the work that they're doing. But there's a difference between accepting the result and holding the government to account and simply trying to frustrate the result yeah, yeah. and trying to overturn the result yeah, yeah. by arguing for another referendum. And I'd like to make some progress on addressing the actual point now, which is that this petition asks us, why wait? Well, since this petition was first proposed in September, we've been able to actually do some waiting, and it's worth considering what has transpired since then, because I think it really does help answer the question posed by the petition. So take the phase one agreement last month, which was a great success for this government. And that testified to the fact that the EU want a good deal too, and they are willing to make concessions to achieve it. Now, there was a time that we had this strange post-referendum doom-monger alliance of the ultra-remainers and Nigel Farage coming together, which was running around and insisting that we would have to pay a punitive Brexit bill of over 50 billion. And this was before anyone had included the implementation period until December 2020. And yet, last month, the overall settlement, including the implementation period, turned out to be much lower. Now, you look at the European Courts of Justice jurisdiction, and we were told that the EU would insist that their courts have jurisdiction over the enforcement of EU citizens' rights here. And yet, last month, we got a time-limited option for our courts to voluntarily refer unclear cases to the European Court of Justice. Now, on the Irish border, we were told that Northern Ireland would have to have a separate deal and effectively remain part of the EU for customs purposes. Yes. I thank uh, the Honourable Member for giving way. I'm a member of the Brexit Select Committee, and when we took evidence, um, it was very clear that the experts that we were talking to we were telling us that basically the can has just been pushed down the road, and the joint statement has um, possibly made a no Brexit scenario uh, less likely, but a hard Brexit scenario also very much less likely, because basically nothing has been resolved. Ross Thompson. I, I thank, thank the Member for her intervention, but it kind of proves the point that from the opposition, we've seen nothing productive. And actually, um, in the same way that they were confounded by the phase one agreement in their argument, you can bet you that after the end of phase two, they'll be confounded in that argument again, because it's only been perpetual pessimism we have had from the opposition benches yeah. when it comes to leaving the European Union and talking Britain down. I'm talking Britain up because we can achieve so much more um, when we leave the European Union, and we have a bright future ahead of us. No, last, uh, yes, I'll take the intervention. I'm very grateful to you for giving way. Would my honourable friend agree with me that it's, uh, it seems that this overwhelming majority of people that want a second uh, a referendum are Remain voters? And that secondly, 
There was no one, as I recall, Remain or otherwise, who was saying that if we have a referendum to leave the European Union, we would need a subsequent referendum on the deal. Is that how my honourable friend saw it as well? Thank you, Madam Chair. Absolutely, I agree um, with the point that my honourable friend has made. And I'd also add to that that if the result had been the other way and that the United Kingdom had voted to remain in the European Union, we would have accepted the result. And I don't think you would see those. I would like to make some more progress, please, um, calling for there to be another referendum to leave the European Union. Now, in relation to what I was saying on the border with Northern Ireland, it was also clear last month that when we are leaving, we leave as one United Kingdom. Now, ah, the doom-mongers would say, sure, you know, phase one was fine, but they're going to punish us in phase two. Well, you'd think that after being wrong about the economic effects of a leave vote, about the economic effects of Article 50 being triggered, and about the outcome of phase one, that they had given up on Project Fear by now, but apparently not. They should consider... Sure, I'll take the intervention. How can anybody know what was right and wrong about forecasts about the economic impact of Brexit when we haven't left yet? And when the Treasury haven't actually done an impact analysis anyway, what's the source of his figures for saying that it's not going to cause any economic problem? Ross Thompson. Thank the Honourable Member for his intervention. And I vividly remember that campaign and being told not just actually leaving the European Union, but the vote to leave yeah. the European Punishment Union, budget. according to the Treasury, would result in a budget which was an emergency budget um, in relation to that, that we'd all have to be in a mass sense of panic that the world was going to collapse around our ears with the economic devastation caused by it, um, and that simply never came to fruition. Yeah. Um, now, what they should consider is actually this month's analysis by the EU Committee of the Regions, uh, which demonstrates why we do have leverage in these Brexit negotiations. Because it found that, unsurprisingly, no deal would be, to put it mildly, not ideal for major industries in the EU 27. The EU, it transpires, cannot afford to be blasé about no deal, and they cannot afford to be intransient in the negotiations. Because a good deal is in our mutual interests. And that is why I am confident that that is exactly what we will get. Because I believe in Brexit. I believe we will make Britain more prosperous and more democratic. We will be able to better equip our economy to face the challenges of the 21st century. Develop agriculture, fisheries and immigration systems that are better tailored to this country's needs. To decouple ourselves from the fortunes of a routinely crisis hit EU. Restore our democracy and enhance devolution at home and become a global leader in free trade. Getting a good deal with the EU is part of that last goal. The truth is, we're not waiting. We're laying the groundwork for the best Brexit possible. One that maintains free trade with our European neighbours while allowing us to reap the benefits of leaving. The last few months have shown that a good Brexit deal is not just achievable, but highly likely. The fears of those who want us to ignore the referendum result and remain, and those who want us to just walk away immediately, have proven to be unfounded. Now, I understand why some Brexit supporters are upset by the efforts of the opposition, the Labour, SNP and Liberal Democrat politicians, to undermine Brexit. But successive votes have shown that in this elected House, we have a Conservative-led cross-party majority for democracy. We will deliver Brexit, both here in Parliament and in the negotiations. There are now just 14 months until we leave. We are in fact closer to exit day than we are to the referendum day. After 45 years of EU membership, it's not much longer to wait and we will be better off for it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah. 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 Yeah.